My homilies are pretty much group spiritual direction. I mean, you know all that. <laughs> of all the ones I have given you, and of all the ones I will ever give you, this is probably the most important one. I consider it absolute essential that every Carmelite who's serious about being a Carmelite needs to understand. So I got a This is rooted as Old Testament Trinity. Because union with God, that John the Cross teaches us, is also called deification, it's also called theosis. Is a participating in the divine life. That's just as a nice term, as a flowery idea, but actually participating in the Trinity. Interest in Elizabeth of the Trinity is not an accident. God is Trinity. And we need to understand that. And even though it's a great mystery, there's a lot we can know. Rubia, in the 13 and 1400s, and in his work as an iconographer, chose to, to depict the three angels who came to Abraham and Sarah at the oak tree at Mamre as Trinity. <coughs> And just a short explanation and then a reading. This is the Father over here, the first one. His head is inclined but not bowed. He is the fountain head of the Trinity. The Son is in the middle. His head is bowed. And the Holy Spirit is on the right and his head is bowed both to the Father. Why is Jesus' head bowed? Because Jesus is humility. He, does, he isn't humble. He is humility. He doesn't love. He is love. Your destiny is to not be humble, but to become humility. To share that. Your destiny is to become love. Beyond loving is to become love. Because you were created in the image and likeness of God. <clears throat> what is the relationship here? Why is he humble and loving? And there's one more, gratitude toward God. <clears throat> his father, because he begat him. Because of his, the Holy Father begot him. And so he is profoundly humble before his father. And he is profoundly grateful that his father began him. And his love for his father is profound. Because he is one. He doesn't know how to do anything else. And exactly the same is true of the Holy Spirit and of the Father. So this is called the divine communio. The divine communio, communion. The relationship, God is not about doctrines, He's about relationship. And He created us in His image. We are not about doctrine. Doctrines really help. To clarify, to help us understand, doctrine has its place. But it's a raft, it's not a shore. <coughs> this is the shore, right here. When I mix the water and the wine, I'm going to say a prayer that's said in secret. This is the prayer. By the mystery of this water and wine, what's the big mystery about water and wine? It is water and wine. What's the mystery? By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ share in the divinity of Christ. What does that mean? As he himself humbled himself to share in our humanity. 
that's established in our liturgy, that by the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ. You're seeing the divinity of Christ. And we're to share in it. And Paul says, we're to be taken as adopted sons and daughters right into the intimate life of the Trinity. And it sounds so ethereally beautiful, all oh, that's wonderful. But here you see it. So if salvation to you is getting out of hell, if that's salvation, that's a really cheap version of salvation. That's about the lowest rung on the ladder. Getting out of a few days of purgatory and getting out of hell altogether, if that's your idea of being saved, it's a really inexpensive idea. It's unworthy because there's so much more. Being saved is life in Christ. Being saved is to enter into the intimacy of the Trinity. He takes us with himself to share the life, the intimate life of the three persons of the Trinity. That's what he does. Can you catch that vision? Do you have any idea what that means? That's what John of the Cross experienced in moments of theosis, in moments of divinization, in moments of intimate union. That's what he experienced. And he was so shocked because he said, it was like God was treating me like an equal. He was treating me like, a, like an equal in this divine communion. The whole seat was right in the middle where the empty space is. That that's your reserved place to share, not as a God, not by nature, but by grace. To be a participant in this communion, this divine communion that the three persons have with each other, which is so unbelievably gorgeous. That's what John experienced. He never got over it. And he couldn't explain it. He could experience it and know, hear what it was. There weren't any words. He didn't write it in poetry out of profound humility. He wrote it in poetry because he couldn't find any other vehicle that would allow him to express what he had to express about it. Now let's put you there. Misty, let's put you there. Jesus' reason for coming to this world was to take you to this place so that you could become love and become gratitude and become humility and enter into this dynamic, into this communion, this divine life. That's why he did it. It wasn't to spring you from hell. Although, in the process, that happens too. <laughs> God. So that's theosis. That's theosis. That's what John taught. In Living Flame of Love, he lays it out. People ask all the time, Father, is a good book on theosis, a good book on union, divinization. Why is that point to an archivist? Because they wrote a lot more on it. But now I can point you to a Catholic priest. When I have a book that I really want to eat, every page and devour it and digest it, I cut it up and punch holes in it, put it in the It becomes, I mess it all up. It becomes my working tool to get an understanding of this. And this book's title, it walked right in the door. I didn't have to go find it, it found me. The Catholic priest named Philip Krill, K-R-I-L-L. And the name of this book is Life in the Trinity, a Catholic vision of communion, that is communion, and deification. There it is. Just two weeks ago. This priest came to the funeral from St. Louis. And he said, Father, can I celebrate with you Sunday morning? I said, sure. So we got to talk to him. He's a kindred spirit. He's done the Jesus prayer his whole life. He's a Roman Catholic priest. He's, he's brilliant. I'm not. He's brilliant. And he, he said, I'll send you a couple books. And we talked and talked and talked. And he said, Theosis, Father, it's the future. 
He said, one, on Kamunio and the Eucharist that's written by Gorgonauts. And he sent me the one he wrote. Amazon.com has it. Uh, Kindle doesn't. Life in the Trinity. So the whole first chapter, the whole first section on Trinity, the things I told you are just the beginning of what he wrote. And you have to read a paragraph at a time, what the Spirit had as they say in marriage and covenant, and the second time for your part. And then chew on it and just think about it. The nine days that I had that I freely tell you about, that's what that was. That's why I kept it open ever in my life. I know what that feels like from the bottom row. I can't get up any higher. But I know that. And it was exactly as John said. <coughs> he, he, he treats you like an equal. I'm going to read you a little bit about Theosis from his book, The Traveling, and then that, that will be done. Theosis is the most accurate term describing patristic doctrine of deification and divinization. It's the most accurate term, Theosis. It means to become a partaker of the divine nature, not have the divine nature be a partaker. It is to become a living theophany of the love of God. It is to participate in the very life of the Trinity through incorporation into the person of Christ. It is now time to explore in greater detail the church consensus that God became man so that man could become God. The fathers are unanimous in this assertion. This mystery is also called divine exchange. As St. Ephraim of the Syrian said, I gave him, we gave him humanity, he gave us divinity. This admirable exchange indicates the mysterious and paradoxical way in which self-emptying of Jesus becomes the theosis of those who partake in divine nature. Jesus' self-emptying is our theosis. It's our invitation into the Trinity. Not as members, but as participants. To live in Christ means to become deified. To be united hypostatically, that is, in your personhood to Jesus, is to become divinized through incorporation into him, the body of Christ. Theosis is the purpose of the incarnation and the signature doctrine of patristic Christianity. Theosis is to be immediately and radically differentiated from, her from heretical views of man's absorption into God, pantheism, eternal progression, quietism, and other heterodox beliefs that picture human persons as somehow melding into the divine essence. We are partakers in the divine nature, not usurpers. Theosis is not the belief that we are God in his essence. It is not the belief that we change into God, or that God replaces some part for all of us. According to the doctrine of deification, God remains God by nature, and man remains man by nature. At the same time, in theosis, the human person comes to participate in the very triune life of God. We become by participation what God is by nature. To quote St. Augustine, we become a partaker in our weakness, bestowing on us a participation in his divinity. Theosis is the anthropological corollary of the Trinitarian mystery. As Maximus Confessor puts it, man becomes God in the same degree as he who is God by nature partook of our weakness and became man. 
Here we see the difference between Christian communio and the heresies of pantheism, MS, and mon monistic uh, union. The goal of theosis is communion with God, in which the human person partakes of the divine nature without thereby becoming divine by nature. The goal of theosis, in other words, is relationship, not identity. The goal of theosis is relationship, not identity. Their identity is divinity. But it's their relationship that we are invited into. Instead, God shared his divinity with man in a way that the image of God in which he was created blossoms into full likeness. Theosis is the realization, we're almost done, of the Trinity's eternal desire to reestablish a connubial union with the fallen world. God wants the relationship he had before with us. Theosis is the grace of the Holy Spirit made possible by the Paschal Mystery of Christ. Our deification in Christ parallels and participates in the hypostatic union, that is the union of the three persons that exist within the Trinity. It occurs without confusion or change of both human nature and divine nature. In divinization, the human person is conformed perfectly to the divine image and likeness of God. As Pope Benedict XVI has said, commenting on the admirable commercium, which he describes as the heart of the gospel, what Benedict describes as the heart of the gospel, quote, this exchange consists of God taking our existence on himself in order to bestow his divine existence on us. This is Ben. Choosing our nothingness in order to give his plenitude it is difficult, even in the patristic literature, to find a better description than Benedict's <coughs> the doctrine of deification. So if you're interested in the, actually the, the tap root of Carmelite spirituality is theosis. It's what John is so clear about. It's life in the Trinity, a Catholic vision of communion and deification by Philip Krill. 